I'm a very sensitive person. <laughs> Insulting our hot table. You and I, mate, this is a conspiracy. <laughs> They're all a Guinness, mate. All right. Wonderful to be with you. So excited to be able to sing. We also applied for an exception at Riverston, so we're there down there singing this morning. Uh, we had a lady who specifically requested, she said, can we please sing to God be the glory when we get free from this, you know. And so, you know, she was quick on the phone when we talked about, oh, don't forget Philip, what you said. <laughs> yes, Heather, that's fine. So isn't it great? Look, let's pray and then we're going to open God's word together. <coughs> Our great Father God, we thank you for your goodness, your love and your provision. We thank you for your word and we pray that as we open it now, you would speak to our hearts and minds. That you would make us into the men and women that you want us to be. Transformed into the image of the glorious Lord Jesus Christ as we seek to serve him in every day. We pray in his worthy name. Amen. Amen. So I want to look at Colossians chapter 3. So turn open to Colossians chapter 3 and uh, we're going to cover the first 17 verses briefly this morning. And uh, what I want to do is look at uh, just some references. If you, if you look at this letter that Paul's written to the Colossians, uh, in chapter 1 he begins to teach us that we were God's enemies. The, the language that Paul uses in Colossians is very encouraging but very strong. Yeah. And I want you to see the strength of what's going to come out in chapter 3 because I think that we as Christians uh, depreciate the import of what's going on here. So in chapter 1 he said we were enemies with God and we've been reconciled to God. And then in chapter 2, he writes that we who are prisoners, spiritual prisoners, have been freed from these things, from the spiritual powers that are at work around us and in us. And then he introduces to us this concept of death. And he wants us to get this message that we've died. He wants us to be boldly transformed. But in order to live a new transformed life, we have to begin with the death of of the old life. We need to see ourselves in a new way. And I think the problem is that sometimes we see ourselves in an old way. I just can't see over this. I'm going to do this. Right. <laughs> it's just this thing in front of me. I'll stand back. I know. It's, you're going to turn it down a little? Or, okay. Wow. I'm so tall. I clearly have issues. That's okay. So he wants to give us, Paul wants us to come away with a new vision of reality. He wants us to see ourselves in a totally different light. He doesn't want us to come away the same. We don't come to the cross and say, yes, take my sin, give me eternal life, and I'll just keep on my merry way. No, no, no. We go to the cross, and when we come away from the cross, we are not the same. And that's what Paul's trying to get us to see this morning. So when we get to this section, I'm just going to reference a verse, verse 20 from chapter 2. He says this, you have died with Christ and he has set you free from the spiritual powers in this world. Now pause and look at that phrase, you have died with Christ. It's past tense, it's complete, it's done. There's nothing lacking in this issue here. The lack is in our understanding and our application of the death that happens when we come to Christ. I think many of the issues that we face as Christians, we face them because we don't accept or live the reality of our death in Christ. And so we kind of treat the Christian life like God's going to stick bits back on that fall off. Now, he wants to completely transform the core. You're a new creation, a new creature. And so what we look at is this reality of death. And when, we, when we accept that Christ died on the cross, we need to realise that there's something more we're missing. So we, we see Christ crucified on the cross, and so we should. I mean, he's the one that has paid the atonement for the sins of the whole world. You haven't paid for your sin. I haven't paid for my sin. We could pay for our sin by going to hell for alternative, but Christ has paid it. So we see Christ on the cross. 
Now, we don't leave him on the cross, as some churches have these statues and so forth, but we know that he went to the cross. But what we need to grasp is that Scripture tells us, I also went to the cross, not to pay for sin, but because my sinful old life doesn't qualify and it needs to die. And so we get this reminder, when I see the cross, I need to be reminded, yes, that he died for me, but I need to be reminded that I've now died. So if I've now died, that should totally transform how I see my life. Because it's no longer my life. Several years ago, uh, I thought through and presented a message at Riverston about the... It was entering into the new year. And the question was, and there was things going on in the world as there always are, the question was, what are you doing with my life, God? And see, that's the wrong question. It's not your life anymore. You died. You, you lost the right to have a right when you die. And so I must die to myself. And I must live and remind myself in this state that I have died with Christ. Because if I forget that I've died, then I get this mistaken idea that I've actually got to say. I get this mistaken idea that I can run my life. And so frankly, when I run my life, which is an idolatry, then what I've done is I've forgotten that I died with Christ. Now, there's some parallel verses to this. Because once I started to research how strongly Paul was getting this message across, I started to see it everywhere. Have a look at this. This is Romans 6, 5 to 11. Since we've been united with him in his death, we'll also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sin sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We're no longer slaves to sin, for when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know that we will also live with him. We are sure of this because Christ is, was raised from the dead. And he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God, so you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. This very strong language here coming out again and again and again. And this is not a metaphorical death. This is not just I'm using words to describe something. This is a metaphysical death. The reality is that I died with Christ. The problem is I carry on like a zombie walking around thinking that I've got animation and that I've got some say and I've got some right and I've got some power and I've got some authority and all that's false thinking because I died. Verse 11 says, consider yourselves to be dead. And so I need to be reminded of this reality. Now, I didn't come up here to be really mean to you all and tell you all this. It's Paul that's doing it. I'm just passing on the message. But the point is also this. That doesn't mean that, like a corpse, we have no life in us. No, no we have all the joy. We have all the life we'll ever need. We have more than we had before. But we've got to start with the fact that we died. And until we recognise that I have died, then we really can't appreciate what it means to live. Here's another verse from Paul. This is Galatians. Galatians 2.20. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Don't start singing. I know you're all excited too. <laughs> so I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So, once again, no equivocation here. I'm not half dead. I'm completely gone. The old core is gone. The new core is Christ. So what's the reality? The reality is I'm still in this body. Paul knows that. We have a lovely lady in our church. She became a believer several years ago, uh, quite late in life. She had a Catholic background. And she struggles. She struggles with judgment. She's judging herself all the time. You know, she's struggling with her salvation in the sense of, you know, am I okay or am I lukewarm? I said to her, you're the least lukewarm person I've ever met. It's a lovely lady in our church. And, uh, but she struggles with it because of the condemnation that got talked to her. Now, that, that stays with her. It's in her psyche because she was brought up with that condemnation through the system that she was brought up in. And we all struggle with things. And what are we going to do with that struggle? The struggle is there's this fight and there's this pressure and it's trying to exert itself. Paul calls it the old nature. And it's trying to exert itself. And we need to recognize and remind that old nature that it died. 
It doesn't have a voice, it doesn't have a say, it doesn't have a right, it doesn't have any sway. And so this is what we need to live our lives with. My inner core is a new core. And it has to be transformed into my outer core. My old life, confronted daily with this truth. Um, sorry, brother, I just jumped into Galatians. We're actually looking at Colossians. Sorry, we better go back to it. <laughs> so, here we go, back in Colossians. So, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1. So this brings us to this chapter. And this is what he says. Since you've been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honour at God's right hand. Now, the death of the old self is the reality, but Jesus doesn't stop there. He wants us to live this new, vibrant, eternal life instead of the old, limited, restricted, fallen life. And so Paul says, set your sights on the new reality. Set your sights on the realities of heaven. He wants us to look up from this world and from the old nature and look to where Christ is seated in honour. Now, to do this, we actually need to replace. That's why I call this a new way of seeing. We actually need to replace what we have, uh, what we have with what God wants us to have, with what the Spirit is bringing to bear in our lives, what Christ wants us to live out, we have to replace it. We can't, we can't just keep the two going on at once. That's a battle that Paul talks about in Romans chapter 7. Yeah. And so this idea of replacing happened to me several years ago. I was listening, I, there was a song on the radio, actually it was about 35 years ago, it was a long time ago, but it's just stuck with me. Very old. But anyway... This song got stuck with me. I heard it once on the radio and it just rattled around my head for two weeks. And it had one, what I consider to be a medium level swear word in it. And so I just, it just annoyed me that I couldn't get this out of my head. And I tried to, you know, change that word to another word. It just wouldn't work. It just kept coming back and back and back. And so I realised I actually had to replace it entirely with something else. And that's what this is about. So I actually replaced it with David Meese's song, Falling Down. Now, embarrass yourselves and tell me, who has heard David Meese's song, Falling Down? One, two, three, four, five, six. Praise the Lord. It's a great song. It starts with this incredible um, piano intro, almost classical, but very upbeat. And then it transforms into 80s rock. Now, that sounds terrible when I speak it out loud, but it's actually a really great song. Lord, you know I tried so hard to do the t things I should and everything I say and do and all things that I could, but the world keeps calling me. And time and time again it seems before I know what's hitting me, I've let you down again and I'm falling down. You know, I'm falling down and I don't understand why I keep losing ground, but every time I do, if I look up to you, then I stop falling down. And I stop falling down because of you. And this beautiful song, powerful song, uh, at that time I, um, uh, I was driving a car as in high school and I was the only guy that had a car. And I only had a car because my wife, a couple of years older than me, had a car. And so I dropped her to work. And, you know, I wasn't married. We were engaged. It doesn't matter. Anyway, the point is, I had a car. It was only a Valiant Glen. It wasn't a really good car. But I would play this thing on the cassette at full bore and annoy my mates all the way to sport and back. Little boys high school. Anyway, there we go. The point is, we have to replace. We can't just live with. We need a new way of seeing, a new reality. And so that's what Paul says. Set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ is seated at the place of honour at God's right hand. Now, how do we set our sights on heaven? How do we keep that vision in mind when so much of the world crashes in and tries to distract us? Well, that's his next point. Verse 2, he says, think about the things of heaven. I think it's great if we can remind ourselves, and I often look at these passages Go to Isaiah chapter 6, and you've got Isaiah there. He's transported to this beautiful throne room, and he sees the Lord high and exalted, and the train filling the temple, and there's the, the teraphim and the seraphim around, and he recognises his own sinfulness, but he's keeping his sights on heaven. Or you go to Revelation, and you go to, say, chapter 4, uh, hang on, chapter 4, and there's John called up into heaven. And he's describing, and even prior to that, when he's talking about Christ walking amongst the candlesticks of the churches, he's setting his sights, he's keeping his mind, he's fixing his vision 
on heaven and the glories of heaven. Not so that we're disconnected from our calling on earth. Not so that we're disconnected from one another. I often think how beautiful it is that uh, when, you know, when Paul talks to married men, he talks to singles and he says, look, if you're single, you don't need to worry so much. But if you're married, you need to care about your wife. You need to please your wife. And so I think it's wonderful the way God has actually, you know, he created Adam and he could have kept Adam for himself. And he recognised Adam needed somebody, and he gave Adam Eve. God, in his gracious, loving kindness, shared Adam with somebody. Do you get that? And so God wants our worship and deserves our praise, but he's also willing to share. He, he's a God that deserves all of our worship and praise, and yet he's willing to share us with each other. So when we set our sights on the things of heaven, it doesn't mean neglect our responsibilities on earth. It doesn't mean neglect our fellowship. It doesn't mean these things. What it means is to live joyfully with the realities of heaven as the forefront of our mind. And so we cast our mind to the present where Christ intercedes and defends for us. We cast our mind to the future where we will stand before him and we'll be with him and we're seated with him. And so he wants us to see ourselves in this other picture. See Jesus seated in glory. Then he says in verse 3, it reminds us once again, for you died to this life and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. So since our old life ended on the cross, logically our new life ends up on the throne. We went to the cross and were crucified with Jesus and we're told we're seated with Christ in the heavenlies. So we don't stay on the cross any more than Christ stayed on the cross because we come away with the new life and now we're with him seated in the heavenlies. And so we have this incredible thing. You see this picture we're looking at here. There's billions gathered before the throne. You can just see the heads of them down there. But Scripture says we're not there. We're actually there. How can that be? Yet Scripture says I'm seated with Christ in the heavenlies. My real life is hidden with Christ in God. And so I'm in this... In we can't plumb the depths of the privilege that we have as being the children of God. We're not disconnected. We're not worshipping from afar. We are with Christ now. And so we have this incredible thing, not because of anything we've done, not because of presumption, but because of all that Christ has done. What happens to him happens to us. Now have a look at John chapter 17 with me. This is the high priestly prayer of Jesus. I just want to reinforce this point, that we are following Christ. And when we're following Christ, yes, we're talking about living and walking with him each day. But what we're also talking about here is that we went to the cross with Christ, not to pay for sin, but because my old life had to die. <laughs> I'm now seated with Christ in the heavenlies. How did that happen? Because of what Christ has done. Now have a look at this from John chapter 17. Verses 20 and 22, 23. I'm praying not only for these disciples. This is Jesus in the garden. The disciples are snoring over there and he's sweating drops of blood about to pay for their sin and yours and mine. And this is what he says, I'm not just praying for these disciples only, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. Welcome to this verse is for you. Yes. And what did he pray for you? He prayed this, I've given them the glory you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me. This is a prayer for you. You see how bonded we are to Christ. He's not over there. And we sometimes lament the fact that, well, those, those disciples, they got to walk with him. They got to fish with him. They got to, to see the dusty streets of Jerusalem together. And we lament that. But you know, Jesus said, it's better if I go. Because then he will come. Who's he? The Holy Spirit. We are now bonded to Christ more closely than Peter was walking with the Lord during the ministry on earth before the death and resurrection of the Lord. That's how closely we are connected to Christ. We want to, we want to see this. We want to accept the unreasonableness of all that Christ has done in our salvation. Because it isn't just about you got your sins paid and you get a ticket to heaven. It's about a totally new life. All right. Verse 4. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. 
As you read this, you should feel waves. I don't mean emotional waves. You should feel the theological waves that wash over. You died with Christ. You're set free. You're forgiven. You're glorified with Him. You're bonded with Him. You've gone. You're seated with Christ in the heavenlies. It just keeps coming. The end to what's the end to what all that He has done? And that's why Scripture says, "He who did not spare His own Son, but freely gave Him up for us all." Is that the start of born free? <laughs> So this is the reality, that we need to recognise our death so that we can embrace our life and all that he has done for us. The before and after difference is as stark as a corpse in a grave versus a child running through a field. This is, this is what you are now. That's what scripture says. It's not what we want you to be or what you hopefully you feel like or what might happen one day. Scripture doesn't talk in those terms. You died with Christ. Where are you now? Seated with Christ in the heavenlies. And what's Jesus' prayer? That we would receive the glory that he receives because we are bonded to him. This is how much has changed in our reality. So let's just focus on this moment, this phrase here. This stuck out to me. Who is your life? Christ, who is your life? See, we see Christ in heaven and then we think about being with Christ in heaven but that's not enough because our life lived on earth is lived now because Christ is my life see he created life he's the author of life and having created life he then came to be the way the truth and the life in his earthly ministry and then following that he is now my life that's why Paul would say to the Galatians, it's no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. That's the reality of it. And this verse, I think, is the key to this section, verses 1 to 17. Verse 4. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world. And I think everything Paul said has led up to this point. All the what you were versus all the what you are hinges at this moment that Christ is my life now. Now, if we, unless we grasp that Christ is our life, then the rest of Colossians is just going to be a guilt trip. He's going to tell us how to live and we're going to feel like failures. We're going to see how far short we fall. And it's just going to be like getting whacked over the head with rules. Unless we recognise that I died and now Christ is my life. There's no more me there's Christ and he wants to use this person to bring glory to himself to further his kingdom to encourage his saints and to worship him and so that's what God wants to do now through this person who was the one who was born Philip Romans 6 2 since we've died to sin how can we continue to live in it and so we need to look at this as a reminder of the reality of who we now are and let's see the next few verses in the light of Christ being our life. Verse 5. Paul begins with our heart and our mind. He says, Put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater. Worshipping the things of this world. And I don't need to spell these things out for you. You know what they are. You know the times that you've failed, the thoughts that you've had in your head. Yeah. And Paul says, put these things away. Put them to death. Why? Because you died. Remind yourself of who you are. You're dead and now Christ is your life. You see, if you set your heart or your mind on pleasure, then it will happily drive you to the grave. If you set your heart or your mind on riches, then it will happily destroy your life. And such cravings are never satisfied. Satisfaction comes from Christ, the eternal, infinite one. Verses 6 to 7. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still part of this world, he says. And the abuse of power or strength, the misuse of your body, the misplaced affections for wealth, these things anger the holy God. And continue to anger a holy God for 6,000 years. And Romans chapter 1 tells us how much God detests this ruining of his beautiful creation. Both the world and the people in it. Now we've been forgiven 
for our part in that. But like gravity pulls on us, it keeps pulling us back down. So we need to put these thoughts to death. Verses 8 to 9, now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behaviour, slander and dirty language. Don't lie to each other, for you've stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. So he's turned from our, heart, our heads to our hearts. And now he's turning to our behaviour. And in these last verses, Paul speaks about the things that destroy others. See, he wants us to clear our mind of those things, put them to death. He wants us to focus our affection on him. And now he wants us to live with love with other people. And these are the things that damage relationship and destroy characters, and the things that Satan wants to use to bring in division. We're just going to look at these ones individually because I think there's a progression here. It starts with anger. And some would say, why can't it be anger? Isn't there such a thing as righteous anger? Yes, but probably not for you. You see, we're pretty poor at judging ourselves. I might justify something as righteous anger. I knew a guy who would often reference the fact that Christ had flipped over the tables in the temple. And this guy wanted, I mean, that's an expression. Flipping a table is a thing. You know, you get angry enough, boom. And this guy's always talking about wanting to flip tables. And I said, I don't think you're qualified to judge if what you're feeling now is righteous anger or not. So please back that down a little bit and we'll talk a bit about it and we'll pray and we'll operate with forgiveness and that made him more frustrated, but that's what he had to accept. That the people around him weren't perfect even though they're creating this angry response in him. Wasn't Jesus angry? Yeah, yeah, he was angry with those that were turning his temple into a marketplace. He was angry with death, with the enemy, with sin. At Lazarus's gravesite, it says that he was angry. A deep anger welled up inside him at Lazarus's grave. But that's Jesus. What are we told? In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Now, anger is usually a perceived injustice. It's, it's, that's not fair, and so I've got this angry response. But because it feels like an injustice, we justify it. But it's very dangerous to do that. And Paul says... Get rid of it. Also, get rid of rage. What's rage? Well, rage is when anger is unchecked. We don't bring that under control. We don't submit that to God. It's going to turn into something really bad. That's rage. Outbursts. It could be simmering and seething. But either way, it's a perfect tool for Satan to use. Because when we're in rage, we're out of control. And if we're out of control, then Satan is having his way in our lives. We need to prevent ourselves from becoming tools of the enemy. He then says malicious behaviour. Why? Because we're going to strike back now. We're going to undermine people. We're going to undercut people. In John 10, 10, which we often quote as, I came to give life and life more abundantly, we need to realise that there's another part to that verse. The verse is this. The thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. And when we operate with anger, rage and malicious behaviour, we're operating the same way that the enemy wants us to. When it talks about the wages of sin is death, Yes, that's eternal death, but also there's wages of sin now. There are consequences for sin now. And so Paul says, get rid of these things. Slander, the verbal manifestation of malicious behaviour. It can actually look like joking. It can look like empathy. It can look like prayer points. But it can be malicious. And we need to watch the heart attitude behind it. Because it will undermine the fellowship and the unity. It's dangerous. It's deadly. And dirty language, often with self-control comes dirty language because when we're, when we're willing to drop the ball in one area of our lives, we'll drop it in another area. And so Paul says, look at this list. Get rid of these things. Don't lie to each other. Don't deceive one another. Don't operate with the language that the enemy uses. And sometimes I can even lie to myself because I'm justifying what I'm doing. Lies destroy lives. Why should we do this? Because I've stripped off my old sinful nature. Lies are the native language of the devil. If my new core is Christ, then what I need to actively work on is getting rid of the outer core, the outer part of me. It's been stripped off and laid to rest. Now, we need to replace it with something. We don't just come away with a list of guilt trips. We come away with something to focus on. And so Paul then says in verse 10, put on your new nature. Right? Get rid of that old one. You've died. Your core is now Christ. What's this old thing doing? 
recognise that it's dead and keep it there because it's not supposed to be getting back out, crawling back out of the grave and giving us a hard time. How do we put this to death? How do we put on a new nature? It says this, put on your new nature and be renewed, how? As you learn to know your creator and become like him. And so the reality is the more that we know Christ, the more that we know him intimately as our friend, as our saviour, as our leader, as our king, the more that we come to know what his nature is like, the more we can be transformed. We can become like him, Paul says, as we learn to know our creator. And so Christ is the most worthy subject of study. In all of all, we're studying the book of Hebrews in Bible study in two different Bible studies because of that. Because the book of Hebrews is essentially Christ is better than, and then you just fill in the blank with anything you like. Christ is better than. Christ is better than the temple. Christ is better than the sacrifices. Christ is better than the world. Christ is better than the priesthood. Christ is better than the kings. Christ is better than Melchizedek. Christ is better than Abraham. It just goes on and on and on. And so what the writer of the Hebrews does is seeks to exalt Christ. And so studying Christ is the most worthy subject. Verse 11, in this new life, it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilian, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters and he lives in all of us. A criminal who comes to Christ is just as dearly loved as a sweet old grandma who came to Christ at a young age and has served God a whole life, just as dearly loved by Christ. A four-year-old and a 104-year-old receive Christ the same way. And so we need to realise that Christ is all that matters. Your heritage doesn't matter. Your religious past doesn't matter. Your upbringing doesn't matter. Having a godly upbringing certainly is a good help, and we're commanded as Christian parents to do that. But if you've come from a broken home or an unchristian home, that is no disadvantage to you now that you're in Christ's kingdom. You are valued just as highly. doesn't matter where you came from or what's happened to you because Christ is all that matters. Okay, so we've looked at the old life. Paul says to put on the new life. What does that look like? Let's go to verse 12. We're on the home stretch now, Aiden. Oh, good. Because I've got another four hours worth of material. It's a long home stretch. No, I'm kidding. It's fine. Hold up here. All right, here we go. Verse 12. Since God chose you to be the holy people God loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, with kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. So God has called you to holiness, and so your behavior should reflect that. Now look at these words here for a moment. I want you to think about them. Tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. I wonder if you assess them and just think to yourself, is there a, is there a root cause that underlies, what's the foundational principle or attitude, do you think, don't call it out, that undermine, underlies those things, tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. What binds all these together? For me, I thought it was this, selflessness. It really goes in line with, I've died. I mean, myself doesn't matter. And if myself doesn't matter, and Christ is all that matters, as Scripture tells me, then I can live a life out of His strength as I'm called to, and that life is going to be filled with the things that He wants to produce. Which means if I don't matter, then tender heart and mercy doesn't cost me anything. Kindness is a good thing. Humility is a natural consequence. Gentleness is the result. Patience is the virtue. And these things come from this idea that I died with Christ. And so selflessness. And I went through a bit of a process recently recognizing that some of the issues, and in fact, as elders, what we met, we met together and we, um, we met every week, but we met, we prayed, and then instead of having a normal elders meeting, what we had pre-planned to do was to go through a self-reflective assessment which we would then share with one another. And so we went through this, myself and Andrew and Link went through this, and we all came up with slightly different things about ourselves that we, we felt the Lord wanted us to do. And for me, this idea of selflessness came out very strongly. Because the things that I don't like 
that I see in myself came about because of selfishness. Because I'd forgotten I died. I thought it was me. And now I'm offended or I'm hurt or I've been overlooked or I have been unappreciated or I have, I, 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 I don't matter because I died. So when I remind myself of that, selflessness was this key principle that I really felt like I wanted the Lord to bring to bear into my life. But what happens, let's say, that I've woken up this morning and I've said, Lord, clothe me with your tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. I want to live a selfless life. I get to church and none of you got the memo. <laughs> what do I do then? You know, if you're all being, you know, fleshly and I'm trying to be godly, how do I face that reality now? Fortunately, Paul doesn't stop. He goes on and tells us what to do. He says, make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you. Oh, that's right, Lord, that long list. So you must forgive others. When I'm hurt by someone who forgot to put on their tender heart of mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience that morning, then what do I do? I give them grace and forgiveness. The same grace and forgiveness that the Lord extends to you every two minutes of every day. Now, yes, it hurts to be hurt, but that's nothing compared to what Christ went through and bore for you on the cross. And why did he do that for you? Because of love. And so this third attitude is clothe yourself with love which binds them all together in perfect unity. Love is the reason that you're saved. Love is the reason that you're his. Love is the reason that he put you here in this church family. And so your response to encountering people should be this. I try to make it my practice. I say, Lord, I love this person. Help me to show it. I have to be reminded of that because otherwise my selfishness is going to take over. My old identity is going to want to stand up and rise up. I love, Lord, I love this person. Help me to show it. That's what we need to be saying. And they don't even need to be offensive to do it. In fact, try and catch yourself before they do it. So I can see Hayden and go, Lord, I love this person. Help me to show it. Before he's even opened his mouth. And so this is how he wants us to live. With selflessness, with forgiveness, with love. Alright, let's finish on three places where Christ wants us to be central and then we're done. Verse 15. Let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body you are called to peace. And always be thankful. Notice that word thankful actually turns up in each of these three places. Thankfulness is so key to our lives. Peace that rests in Christ. Peace amid the chaos. Peace no matter what's going on. Peace and thankfulness hand in hand. And I recognise that I need peace. I so often lack peace. In fact, my lack of peace generates lack of peace in my family. And so Robin says to me, you are so stressed. You're making us stressed. Oh, I'm sorry. Go back to being dead in Christ. So I miss out on peace. I get that other P word, panic, instead. Now, I do have a lot of responsibilities, I do have a lot of busyness, but that's no excuse for panic over peace. In fact, it reminded me, and I saw this, this is on a church sign near our church. I won't tell you which church it is, but have a look carefully at that sign, and I think you'll realise that they missed out on peace. Yeah, they got peas instead. And we can be that close to getting peace and miss it. Because we forgot that I died. And then it becomes about me. And then there's no peace. Because I've taken my eyes off Christ. So Christ needs to be central in my heart. That's the first place Christ needs to be central. For each of us as individuals, make that your goal. Put Christ as the centre of your heart. Okay. Peace not as the world gives, but genuine peace. Verse 16. Let the message of Christ in all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel one another, each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with God, uh, to God with thankful hearts. And so where is this message of Christ being shared? It's being shared at church here. And so this word of Christ becomes central to our lives as a faith community, as a church body as a local 
group of believers, we are to let Christ's presence be central to everything that we do. We encourage one another to grow as we share God's word with one another. This is the second place that Christ should be central. Number one, it should be central in your heart. Number two, it should be central in the church. We desperately need to remind each other on this journey to encourage one another and to strengthen one another as we go through this journey together. All right, last verse. And whatever you do or say, oh, by the way, let me go back for a sec. Thankful hearts, see that thankfulness there again? Thankfulness is so key. Because thankfulness turns our grumbling into praise. It turns our self-focus into worship. It stops looking at what we lack and starts looking at all that we've been given. Thankfulness really has to come out of this. Okay, let's keep going. Here we go. So this is whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to him, to God the Father. This thankfulness flows out from a heart into a church and then into the world. This is the place where Christ needs to be central. Now, he's not going to be until he comes back. Why? Because as the Lord himself said, the road to destruction and hell is broad and many walk it. The road to life is narrow and only a few find it. But when he does come back, he will be central. He will be central to this world. But how are we to live? We're to live with that reality now. Let's to live as if Christ really is the king of this world, because he is. And we think about him being sovereign over the nations, bringing about his purposes, and what looks like chaos to us, what looks like political turmoil to us, what looks like pandemic to us, is still part of the sovereign plan of God. He hasn't let go of the wheel. He hasn't dropped the ball. He hasn't snoozed at the wheel. He's in charge, and he's bringing history to his purposes and his conclusions. And so let us live with the reality that Christ is central in my heart, that he is central in our church, and that he is central in the world. This world is no longer my home. My real home is in heaven. I'm seated with Christ there now. And so I've got to live with the reality. Let me ask you this question. Are you proud of your homeland? I'm not talking about Australia or South Africa or New Zealand. Talk about heaven, that's your homeland. Are you proud of your homeland? Are you proud of the king? Do you wear that badge with honour that says, I am his, I am a citizen of heaven. That's where I am living. You'll be called home. And you get to report back to the one who has saved you. So Paul's desire was to present everyone complete in Christ. And it is also the desire of the leaders of this church and our church at Riverston it's my desire and presented. The only reason to, to preach is to facilitate presenting everyone perfect in Christ. The only reason for sharing the gospel is to present everyone perfect in Christ. The only reason for ministering at a bedside with a sick person is to present everyone complete in Christ. And so we, as we do those, we are operating out of exactly what Christ wants us to do, becoming who we already are. And that's why we need to have a new way of seeing. Peter wrote, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 9, that if we, get, if we forget all that he has done in our lives already, it's just because we're nearsighted and blind. We need to be reminded. So I don't want to take my eyes off Jesus. I don't want to look at myself and my circumstances because I'll sink like Peter did. Instead, Christ is all that matters. Now, there's a lot in this section, verses 1 to 17. And can I encourage you to go back over this and just start to see the breaks and the divisions and the purposes and the plans of what the Holy Spirit has written in this section to take us from the reality of our death to the reality of our new life seated with Christ in the heavenlies. Let me pray for you. Father God, I want to thank you for this little section of Scripture. Lord, as I was reflecting during the week on the different parts, we, we preach from all over Scripture because your Word is gold sharp, two-edged sword, living and active. It's so powerful. This is not a book. This is the revelation of the triune God. And as we fill our lives with your word, and as we rely on your spirit, transform us to being the people that you've already made us. For we have died, and my life is hidden with Christ in God. So, Lord, help me to live that way by loving, by serving, by selflessness. 
and by seeking to glorify you in all that I do and say, for I ask it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Phil, for those challenging but wonderful words. And we're going to sing some more of them in our next hymn. Yes, there it is. Wonderful words of life. But just, just to say quickly, Phil, what you've spoken to us today, yes, is huge. But we don't have to do it in our own power. And then to that. So let's stand and sing wonderful words of life. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let them take hold of it. experienced those wonderful words that give us life that without that we were dead but Lord that death involves the death of my nature as we've just heard help us now to live in that new life as we go out of here today help us to be encouraged to go forwards in our new life in Christ Lord I pray for your blessing on each one of us help us to be mindful of these words as we go through our week. Watch over us and keep us now. In Jesus' precious name, amen. amen.